ones that are in there. Right. I think so, yeah. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Ready? We're on the record. Okay. It is 1 30. It's the time on our schedule for uh, to listen to or to take a look at a reconsideration request on file number. ZC 0028 21. Um, before we start, is there anybody that has hearing or visual impairments that might need some help? See none. Uh, we'll call for conflicts. Commissioner Connolly has no conflict. Commissioner McDonald, I have no conflict. Um, so moving along, let me start out by saying that um, this is a reconsideration. So the order will be a little bit different than what we normally do in a, a regular planning hearing. And the portion of, of the reconsideration that we're taking up is the adverse impact. Um, for delivery of public services, and we're going to limit um, comments to those only. Um, so for those that wish to speak during the public comment portion, um, please make sure you limit your comments to you just the delivery of public services issue. It's something that we thought we had covered in our deliberation, and even though it may have been on our, our minds, we didn't, we didn't um, actually speak directly to it on the record, so that's why we decided to, to take this portion of the reconsideration. And with that, I will uh, we'll talk about a public hearing here. For those that may not be familiar, um, that's weird to have that right in the middle. Um, staff's going to present, and then we're going to actually have the applicant, which in this case is the attorney for uh, for um, Keith Bonner County Rural, um, speak, and then we'll uh, then we'll get into uh, a rebuttal from the applicant um, or from the from the, um, the landowner, their representative. And then we'll go into public testimony, and then the rebuttal time will be taken up by the uh, by the applicant, which is uh, Keep Under County Rural's representative. So, with that, if staff uh, may begin whenever they are ready. Members of the public, commissioners, good afternoon. Daniel Britt, planning staff. For the record, we're here to discuss a reconsideration of zone change from May of twenty. To what? Oh, pardon. Makes it easier to read. That was a false start. <laughs> <laughs> 10-yard penalty, false start. No. Okay. I can go home now. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think it's only five yard penalty. False start. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. Anyway, uh, we're here to discuss the reconsideration of zone change from AF20 to AF10, the reconsideration portion. Scope of the reconsideration. The Board of County Commissioners decided on March 15, 2022, to reconsider a portion of the file ZC0028-21, a zone change request from AF20 to AF10. A portion of the decision the Board of County Commissioners are reconsidering are the effects on the delivery of services by any political subdivision providing public service, including school districts. The reconsideration of delivery of services was evaluated against Bonner, Bonner, Bonner County Revised Code and Idaho Statute Title 67, Chapter 65. There's two, there's four parts to BC RC 12263 portion B and D are applicable here today. So the initial decision, the board may consider the reconsideration motion as scheduled in an open business meeting agenda and determine whether to grant or deny the request. If the board grants reconsideration in whole or in part, the hearing before the board will be scheduled to address the, the specific deficiencies identified by the applicant or affected person and allow interested persons to have the opportunity to be heard. If the board denies the request for reconsideration, it should promptly notify the parties in writing. That step was taken on March 15th. We're here today for part D, which is the decision. So following the hearing of the reconsideration, the board may affirm, reverse, or modify its prior decision and shall provide a written decision to the applicant and the affected person or persons within 60 days of receipt of the request for reconsideration. If the board fails to timely decide, the original decision of the board will stand. Idaho State Statute, Title 67, Chapter 65, Local Land Use Planning. So 67, 
6511 zoning ordinance, each governing board shall by ordinance adopt, amend, or repealed in accordance with the notice of the hearing procedures provided under the section 676509 Idaho code, establish when if within its jurisdiction, one or more zones or zoning districts where appropriate. The zoning district shall be in accordance with the policy set forth in the adopted comprehensive plan. So ordinance established zoning district shall be amended as follows. Request for the, an amendment to the zoning ordinance shall be submitted to the zoning or the planning and zoning commission, commission, which shall evaluate the request to determine the extent and nature of the amendment requested. Particular consideration shall be given to the effects of any proposed zone change upon the deliveries of services by any political subdivision providing public services, including school districts within the planning jurisdiction. An amendment of the zoning ordinance applicable to the owner's land or approval of the condition rezone or denial of the request of the rezone may be subject to a regulatory taken analysis provided by section 67-8003 Idaho code, consistent with the requirements established thereby. Excuse me for a second. These are the following agencies that were notified of this reconsideration as well as the original file. They were all noticed with the same memo. I took the extra step and emailed each one of these agencies individually and tried to elicit a response from them. Northside Fire District plans on attending meeting today, so I'm not sure if they're here or not. Yeah, they're back here. Okay, so I'm sure they will be speaking um, about their services. I don't know Fish and Game, Game submitted a three-page letter commenting on the potential of, uh, impacts to wildlife. You can see the attached letter that could be found on the website and also in your binders this afternoon. Bonner County Sheriff, though they were not routed, um, did take the time to respond or weigh in on this zone change. Um, the sheriff said doubling the density in this area, along with the rest of the growth of the county, stretches the infrastructure of law enforcement extremely thin. Further, the access to some of these parcels for example, <clears throat> those accessed by Thimbleberry Lane is impassable to emergency vehicles, at least part of the year. Road and Bridge, they wrote a fairly extensive comment. These are some highlights from theirs. Once again, the full comment can be found inside the um, staff report as well as the binders. So the proposed zone change will not have an, any significant impact on Road and Bridge Department. Colburn Culver Road and Rapid Lightning Road are capable of handling the increased traffic that could ultimately be generated by change in zoning density. Lower Pack River Road is currently failing and in its current state due to substandard base and current needs need to be re and currently needs to be reconstructed. A typical arterial road, arterial road at 45 miles an hour can reasonably accommodate approximately 16,000 cars per day or 8,000 per lane. Traffic count back in 2018 at Highway 200 and Culver and Culver was approximately 1,400 vehicles per day. Lake Ponderé School District um, responded, historically from Northside School, dating back to the years 1999 to 2000, these numbers are based on a fall count. Currently, the enrollment as of today, April 11, 2022, is 180 students. Northside Elementary currently has two portable classrooms in addition to the interior classrooms. At one time, there was an additional portable and a total of three on campus. Regardless of student population, Lake Ponderay School District is committed to providing high quality of education to all students who attend. So an increase in Number of students will require more portable classrooms or construction projects. So the highest number that they'd shown on their um, enrollment count was 211, and that was back in 2001, 2002 school year. Lake Ponderay School Transportation. I don't see any impact to our ability to provide school, school busing with the requested zone change. Currently our buses have adequate capacity 
in that area to accommodate additional students if necessary. I know Department of Water Res Resources <clears throat> takes no position on this proposal, but recognizes that some activities will fall within their, its jurisdiction. Construction of new well must comply with um, well drilling requirements, section 42.235 Idaho code and applicable well construction rules. If the proposed well is intended to be used for domestic purpose as defined in Idaho code 42-111 for household no more than 13 gallons per day, including up to a half acre of irrigation. Use will require no approval from IWR. If the well will be used to irrigate more than a half acre, use more than 13,000 gallons per day or shared by one or more household, the owner will need to file for and receive approval of an application for permit before the well permit can be approved. Northern Lights Utility Company. Northern Lights will continue to maintain these lines as member services in line with our policies. Should a zone change be followed up by a subsequent subdivision application, Northern Lights has the capacity to extend services to those lots and parcels consistent with our line extension policies. Army Corps of Engineers, based on the NWI maps that were included with this application to the county, it appears wetlands are located within the parcel area. And if the landowner developer proposes to discharge fill material into the wetlands on the property, they will need to apply, need to apply to the Corps for section or a section 404 Clean Water Act permit authorization. However, since the application is for zone change, and at this time, there is no does not appear to be any proposed plans for development. The Corps is unable to provide comment on the type of permit that will be needed to apply for and go through the 404 permitting process. Um, I had a little more to say on that. That's also attached for full comment in the binder. That concludes my presentation. I can take any questions the commissioners may have. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions for staff at this point? Okay, let's move on to the um, Keep Bonner County Rural. What do we have him? Is he zoomed in? Pardon? Preston Carter. Preston Carter. Yeah. Hello, Preston, everyone. Can you hear us? This is Preston. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. If you could speak up or get closer to the mic, that'd be awesome. Okay. Um, I guess I've got a quick question. I do have a PowerPoint presentation. If I can share my screen, that would be great. Yeah, hang on for a second. We'll get that worked out. Perfect. Give it a shot now. Do we have to get out of this though? Uh, no. Okay. Okay, let me. Great. Okay, so first of all, thanks everyone for accommodating me. I know last time this was scheduled literally two minutes beforehand there was a gas leak in my building so i had to evacuate and really appreciate um, everyone's accommodations um, so as noted uh, my name is preston carter my business address is 601 west bannock street in boise um, representing keep bonner county rural uh, which is the petitioner today um, the commission is sort of and staff and everyone is, is familiar with the background. We just hit a few highlights. This is the application it was a rezone from 20 acre to 10 acre parcels, uh, not accompanied by a specific development plan. This would effectively double the allowable density of the property. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended denial. In a two to one decision, the board overturned the recommendation. And then, as staff noted, reconsideration was granted regarding the impact of the zone change on the provision of services. Given that reconsideration was granted on that issue, I'll focus my attention uh, on that issue. Just sort of for the record, there were more issues in the petition. As I understand it, those are all in the record. Um, so I don't need to spend time on those today, but not abandoning them for purposes of moving forward. Um, so first, 
I want to talk through a couple aspects of this zoning decision that relate to the consideration of impact. Um, this highlights the importance of considering the impacts on services now rather than delaying that consideration uh, into the future. So the first point is that this is a discretionary decision by the board. Um, being in Idaho and particularly in Bonner County, there are a lot of discussions about property rights, which is absolutely appropriate and part of LUPA and part of the process. The applicant has a property right in their current zoning, but not to change the zoning. So this is a discretionary decision. Consideration of the impacts is statutorily required. And so denying the zone change based on the impact or the board's failure to adequately consider the impacts, i.e. if the board feels as though it doesn't have enough information to give particular consideration to the impacts, that's a valid reason for denying the application today. It's a discretionary decision. The applicant does not have a property right to change its zoning. The second sort of point framing this is there's really one chance to get this right. And that flows from the fact that a petitioner does have a property right in their current zoning. So once the commission increases the density, the commission can't later decrease it, or at least it's very difficult to do so. The inverse is not true. If the commission retains the existing density, the commission can later increase the density in the context of a particular development proposal. So this is one of those one-way ratchets. We hear about one-way ratchets, at least in environmental law, where the decision that's made today will dictate the options that are available in the future. But it's a one-way ratchet. If the commission grants the zoning application today, it cannot go back to 10 acre parcels in the future, at least that's very difficult because the applicant will have a property right in the allowed density. However, if the commission denies the zoning application now, it can later in the context of a particular development proposal, increase the density to 10 acre parcels. One way to think about it is denials temporary, approvals forever. Um, and this relates to the consideration of the impacts because it's important to know and consider the impacts now because you can't go backwards in the future. This is my final sort of general framework of points to consider um, when making this decision. Today's decision will limit the county's options in the future. So this is just an excerpt from the board's decision um, granting the, or overturning PNZ's recommendation to deny. So this says the process of creating 10 acre parcels would require the applicant to go through the subdivision process, better addressing the specifications of the code, such as those related to services, wetlands, et cetera. Um, so far as I could tell, this is where in the written decision, it came closest to considering the impact of the zoning application on services. And there's a real problem with this reasoning. The reasoning being, we'll consider the services when there's a subdivision, and that's because the decision today will limit the county's options in the context of a subdivision proposal. So yes, you can consider impacts in the context of a subdivision proposal, but it needs to be done today. And I would argue that's why LUPA requires consideration of the impacts in a zoning change, because in the context of a subdivision, the commission can't decrease the density. So the decision you make today will limit the ability of the decision of the commission to make decisions in the future. And that will it'll limit the options of, of this board of this commission. Um, you know, if a subdivision application were filed next week, um, well, you can't go back to 10 acre zones, uh, excuse me, 10 acre parcels. It will limit the options of future commissions. Let's say a subdivision proposal comes in several years from now, that commission will be limited in its ability to deal with the impacts of that subdivision proposal. And, and it limits the ability to respond to facts that we don't know yet and that aren't foreseeable. So there was some commentary in the record about 
Well, we don't really know what the impacts will be because we don't have a development proposal. And that's sort of the point. Um, without a development proposal, if an increase in density is granted, you are limiting the commission's ability to deal with impacts that aren't known and impacts that aren't foreseeable. This highlights the importance of the obligation to consider the impacts of the zoning change today. So here's the, the statute that was recited accurately by staff, highlighted here, particular consideration shall be given to the effects of any proposed zone change upon the delivery of services by any political subdivision providing public services, including school districts within the planning jurisdiction. Uh, this is a mandatory duty, you know, shall give, or particular consideration shall be given. If there's President, not, can, I interrupt, President can I interrupt for a second? Can you try to speak up a little bit more? Yes, I will. Please, thank you. All right. So I feel like I'm yelling, but I, if, if it doesn't sound that way on your end, I will increase my volume. Um, so this is mandatory. Particular consideration shall be given to the effects of the proposed zone change. Um, and if there's not sufficient information in the record to fulfill this duty, the application should be denied and the applicant can always refile. Again, this is a mandatory legal duty. If the commission feels like there's not enough information to fulfill this duty, um, it needs to deny and later the applicant can provide sufficient information. So looking through the record, it seemed that the primary areas of consideration or the primary areas of service that ought to be considered are fire schools, water traffic. I heard a new one today in staff presentation, which is emergency services. I guess I'll just hit that first. It seems that the sheriff's comments that roads are impassable to emergency vehicles for part of the year is concerning. Um, it would seem that this concern ought to be addressed. It's difficult to address these sorts of impacts in the context of a zoning change. When there is a development application, that often provides the opportunity to um, consider the options of mitigating or guarding against the impacts. And so I would suggest here that the impacts to emergency services, which isn't in my presentation, but was noted um, ways against granting the zoning change. But I'll, I'll go to fire and my focus here, you'll, you'll pick up on it here. So this is the application. Um, this is the provision related to fire. Which fire district will serve the project site north side? Uh, there's no information on whether the effect will be positive or negative. There is no information on what those effects might be, i.e. no quantification of the effects, and really no information other than the bare identity of the district. So again, the board's legal duty here is to give particular consideration of the effects of the zone change on the Northside Fire District. Does the board feel as though it has sufficient information to fulfill that mandatory legal duty in the absence of information on what those effects might be? I would suggest that the answer to that is no. On schools, similarly, the application has no information analysis on the impact of schools, certainly no quantification about what those effects might be. There are comments in the record noting the overcrowding. I've excerpted the school district's comments here. Um, I would characterize this as a laudable commitment to continuing to provide high quality education services as is the district's duty. Um, but does this provide sufficient information for the board to consider the impacts of the zoning change I would suggest not. On water, 
Uh, this is a provision of the application on water, uh, no information. The comments note sort of wells running dry and dry and other issues with water in the vicinity. There's a comment from an employee of the Odin Water Association regarding legitimate concerns about serving existing connections. And again, I think in the context of the board's legal duty to consider the impacts on services of the application, in this context, there simply isn't enough information to carry out that legal duty. On traffic, this is the provision of the application regarding traffic. Again, there's no traffic study, no quantification of what the impacts might be. The road and bridge comment says the ability to serve, but you know, the question, the statute isn't, is there the ability to serve? The question is, or excuse me, the statute requires the board to give particular consideration to the effects on services. The effects here aren't quantified. I would suggest that the board doesn't have sufficient information to carry out its legal duty. And here's a bit of, of, the, of the upshot. This is the applicant's proposal. The applicant has the ability to gather and provide this information. The applicant, sort of going back to the initial slide, this is a discretionary decision by the board. The applicant does not have a property right to change its zoning. And if today's application were denied because the board feels that it did not have sufficient information to carry out its duty, the applicant always has the ability to provide that information in a subsequent filing. I would also ask sort of legalities aside, I mean, I, I do think particularly on fire, but also a number of other um, services, I do think there is not sufficient information for the board to carry out its legal duty. But legalities aside, the ultimate question is, is it prudent to approve a zoning change on this record? Or would it be better to make the decision when the facts are known, the effects, aren't, the effects of the zoning change are quantified, and there's an opportunity to mitigate those effects. So this is my conclusion. Keep on our county, county rural would suggest that the current application should be denied. It doesn't appear that the county has sufficient information to carry out its mandatory duty of giving particular consideration to the effects of the zone change on services. Approval is forever, denial is temporary, approval is forever. Um, the applicant is free to refile with more information or sort of better yet from, from our perspective, request a rezone in the context of a particular development approved proposal so that the effects of the zoning change are known, are quantified um, and can be addressed. I've got some other issues with the decision, which I'm gonna just breeze through super fast. I understand and respect the board's limitation. I do feel the need to sort of preserve these for the client, so I'll do them very fast. I've got concerns about the timing. We don't think the applicant demonstrated that the zone change was necessary. And there are public statements which are attached to Keep Bonner, Rural, Keep Bonner County Rural's petition that are concerning and I, in my view, potentially lead uh, to some legal weakness in the decision. And with that, I will rest. Okay. Um, I was remiss in letting um, Northside Fire speak. So Northside Fire, if you wanna come up and uh and talk to the impact. 
make sure you identify your name for the record. Too. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I know it's not amplified. It's just oh, okay. goes into the recording. Uh, Vernon Roof, Northside Fire District. I'm the commissioner for District 3, which encompasses the particular zoning change area that we're discussing today. Um, we had quite a few people reach out to us wondering, hey, why, why didn't you guys make a comment on the impact form that was sent out? And we usually do not make any impact unless we know a little bit more about the actual project. So that's why we're here today. We did not think we were going to be able to answer any questions, but we do have a prepared statement that I'll go ahead and read. And then certainly after the meeting, if you've got any comments, uh, both myself and Chief Mitten, he's at the back of the room there. We can certainly hang around if you had any questions. Uh, the Northside Fire District felt it was important to attend this meeting so as to discuss the possible impacts regarding proposed zoning changes relating to a 700 acre parcel in the district. From a planning perspective, it's somewhat difficult to take all the possible variables into account when considering a rezoning issue that could involve the possible construction of residential subdivisions and a yet to be determined number of housing units. This was a rationale for the lack of comment on the planning department notice form. The district feels it's important to not weigh in totally on any and all projects until all the possible impacts are known so that we can get a better picture of the depth and complexity of a particular project. What we can surmise though, and this is just rough, a rough guess and a rough calculation, if projecting for the minimum and maximum range of the build out for the proposed single family residential units in that particular district or that particular zone, it would represent an increase in yearly responses of about 2% or about 25 calls that we would add to our annual incident responses. This in itself does not present a problem Though in a small combination fire department, which we are, we're paid and volunteer, any increase in calls for service without a corresponding increase of available staffing will always present somewhat of a challenge. If I may, commissioners, uh, if anyone's looking to become a volunteer, please contact either Chief <laughs> Mitten and I afterwards. I, I, I promise I won't mention any other comments about that. Uh, we do feel comfortable in the process that once a developer or homeowner's plan is put to paper and moved to the approval phase, the fire district will refer to the 2018 International Fire Code, which contains regulations to safeguard life, property from explosion and fire hazards in new and existing occupancies. The different agencies will then address issues such as general precautions, emergency planning, preparedness, fire department access, water supplies, fire flows, and automatic sprinklers, just to name a few. It then becomes a collaborative effort between the parties involved, some flexibility is involved in certain requirements, depending on specific circumstances, with the ultimate decision oftentimes falling upon what is termed as the authority having jurisdiction, which would be the Northside Fire District. Fire District will always look to the following issues as critical, emergency vehicle access, water sources and availability. And just to remind everybody that for the better portion of our district, we bring the water with us. We have a limited supply of hydrants, so we're looking for ponds, lakes, streams. If anybody is ever wondering, we don't pump from septic tanks. <laughs> and looking back at some of our records, the district has frequently given feedback regarding specific projects. And I can give you a few just to uh, check out if you'd like. Bridalwood Estates, Highway 200 and Nellie Gale, for those of you that are familiar, Highway 200, about mile marker 35. It runs off on the left-hand side of the road but we required all access road for that particular uh, jurisdiction or that subdivision. Reserve road, which is off Colburn Cover, we required all access road access. And then uh, the Idaho Club, we required all access roads, hydrants and residential sprinklers. Uh, once again, that's, that's all I have today. And once again, Chief Mitten and I will be here afterwards. And uh, you know our number. Thank you. John, are you, uh, you ready to roll? Sure. Okay. Where do you want to go over there? Or... Uh, anywhere you like. You might be more comfortable over there. The seating's kind of, we added extra seats because we're unable to use the lower floor because our elections is using the, uh, the big room, so. Certainly. All right, John Finney, I'm the attorney for the applicant, not the reconsideration applicant, the landowner applicant. 
And just to refresh and to make clear in this reconsideration record, the applicant stated purpose of the rezone request was re to return to the prior zoning of 10 acre parcels that existed under the two or prior to 2008 rezone of his property. As the applicant indicated, he didn't have notice. He did, did not participate uh, in that process. And that's the stated purpose. He's not doing this in anticipation of development and as stated in the prior proceedings, the uh, bulk of his property that he owned in 2008 uh, was zoned 10 acres at the time he acquired it. He has a, um, added some parcels since 2008 that were identified at various points in time, and he is seeking to have those returned to their prior to 2008 status. Also, it's important to note for this reconsideration that the stated requester is KBCR, Keep Bonner County Rural. I would note for the record that it's not does not meet the definition of an affected person. It's not identified any land that it owns. It's impacted by this zone change, nor as it relates to today's direct questions as to the impact of a public services. Hey John, let me let me just jump in. And actually, I'm I'm a little it originally was KCBR, but then it came back as Christina Kingsley. So we do have an affected person. We actually have 28. We have 28. And they're all uh, adjacent and semi-adjacent. Right? So I just want to make sure I because that was my fault for saying Keep Bonner County Rural. All right. Well, I didn't hear council uh, identify any other people he was that's representing. True. So at this point in time, that's all we've got in the record. But so then the underlying issue as to that may be as to whether there's sufficient evidence as to whether there is a sufficient impact on a property right of uh, people that assert to be affected persons. As it relates to comments from council, uh, council admits that it's not a one way ratchet. As demonstrated in 2008, Mr. Skinner's property was zoned from 10 to 20 acres. Uh, that was without his request, without his uh, direct knowledge, without his participation, and a countywide zoning or sub area zoning or uh, regional zoning can proceed as part of the county's uh, legislative processes. As it relates to 65, excuse me, 67 6511 and the consideration and due consideration of the impacts on public services. The statute does not provide that there shall be no impact, does not provide that there shall be positive impact, does not provide that it shall be negative impact. It's for the county commissioners to take into consideration and to give consideration. So that does not mean that if uh, one more portable has to be added at Northside that that disqualifies his own change. What it means is that it's to be taken into consideration as with other planning questions and planning decisions, it's a plan to move forward. Planning and zoning does not, is not a plan to lock in existing uses. It's how to provide for uh, growth that's anticipated in a community. And that's what the underlying purpose or cause of that statute and it's in the various parts that provide. We're just dealing with zone, zoning and zone changings today. Uh, I would note for the record, and I think the county could take uh, notice of this without it, but the sheriff does not provide EMS or ambulance services. The, sheriff, the county provides those through a different department. Uh, Odin Water is not a public water system. It has no tax base. It has no obligation to add members or to provide certain areas. It's a water system in that area, uh, but it is not a public water system. It is a membership association. As stated by the fire department, uh, they make comments when it's time to consider what impacts may arise by a subdivision. Uh, this application is not for a subdivision. Whether or not that's a good idea or not a good idea to have a subdivision have to come forward, that's not the way state code is written and that's not the way any county ordinance is written at this point in time. Uh, as I say, whether that's a good idea or not, can take it up with legislators, can take it up with the county commissioners uh, to seek to change those things if that's an appropriate uh, thought or consideration. So we would submit that the board does have sufficient information to consider the impacts of this zone change back to the 2008 zoning of 10 acre minimums. And as uh, initially presented by Mr. Provolt with uh, kind of ad nauseum data and information, this is not a high density. This is not even in the rural zone. This is in the ag forest zone and it's consistent with the comp plan that provides for 10 or 20 acre parcels. And we would submit that the underlying facts uh, and as it relates to the land itself does support the discretionary decision to return it to 10 acre minimums. 
Any questions? Any questions? No. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Andy, do you want to speak at all? Okay. I want to make sure. Okay. With that, then we will go ahead and open it up for uh, public comment. Um, question? Is anyone from Bangladesh? Looks like somebody's raising their hand back there. But I think we have two. We have a big issue here with the fact that they are not a public entity. This is public services. Um, they're a private service. That, uh, I'm a public service. I'm like, they're a public service. Public Your taxpayer funded service? I'm a local subdivision of the tax paying district of the hospital and under Idaho code. And I think I fit the definition. Hmm. Let's consider that. So anyway, yeah, and I don't, I don't know that they actually served that, that property so, to begin with. We do have a pipe running there because we do serve Northside, mm -hmm. the school, the school, and we currently, we currently do not have any more hookups. Can you identify your name for the record? I'm please? Nathan Wood with, and I'm not with Old Water. Uh, the lawyer put it properly: is we are not a public service. Right. So that's why we were not informed or given or able to give a proper response to public service response, fire district and whatnot. So that's why yeah, we don't have any hookups at the moment. That's all I can really say. And so okay. that is our, in a nutshell, our response. Great, all right. And were you contacted to, to service anything inside this possible um, Subdivision. So no, because back to what the fire district said is we're only brought in when there is a, uh, a house that needs water. So we weren't, I am just here because so the people who, if, if it is separated and whatnot, know that there is not water. Because realtors like to put on that there's water and we cannot. Okay. So more of a public service. Okay. Okay, so let's go those in favor of uh, the, anybody wish to speak in favor? Yeah. You wish to speak in favor? Dan, can I speak to this? Uh, I mean, Dan McDonald, uh, go ahead. not Dan Rose. Um, so the, the statute does say that um, you shall give particular consideration to the provision of um, services by a political subdivision. My question to you, Mr. Rose, is do you speak on behalf of the, so you, can you restate your position? I am a trustee with Tenderlay Hospital District, and we are a political subdivision, and I need to speak to the issue of what has or has not been done with us in this. Division. Okay, have, have you guys as a group made any formal decision making, reviewed this file, or is this just your personal, are you acting as in a, in a personal capacity? I'll return the question. Has this board or anybody out of this government reached out to the Tenderlay Hospital District like they're supposed to? Uh, no. So well, okay. So if, if there's no if there's no official position by this by the hospital district, and you're only speaking in your personal capacity, I would suggest that he just go ahead and get to speak during public comment, like yeah. everybody else. Yeah, unless we have something saying that he's representing the hospital, the it, entire it, board. But that's very Can we represent that the body has reached out to the hospital district? Daniel, all, all taxing you, districts. All taxing. Yes. Yeah, all taxing districts. For his own changes, taxing districts. Okay. So they've all been. Yes. Not a taxing. You're not a taxing district. district. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying to Dan. That's what I'm telling him is we get out of the same boat. So, right. So that's, no, they, they are a taxing district. district. They are. They are a taxing district, but they were they were solicited for comment and chose not to respond. So, oh, so, that's what so you're certainly welcome to speak just as a private okay. citizen in the public portion. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody neutral? By any chance? Tell me, we finally have a neutral yeah. person. Anybody, Susan, you want to be neutral today? No. Okay. I've tried that. Yeah, you want to be, you want to be, okay. So with that, we will go, uh, um, anyone opposed? Um, how many people want to speak by show of hands? But should we clarify first before you say opposed? So we're in, in keeping with the procedure of this hearing. <laughs> if you are in in favor of granting the request for right. consideration. And the roles are reversed here. Remember these, these roles are reversed. Um, I don't need to confuse everyone. <laughs> Uh, Does that make so, sense? So a no is a yes, and a yes is a no. Can I ask a question? Sure. Well, the, 
the request for reconsideration was already granted. So that ship already sailed. This is, I, I disagree. So this, this entire process um, is, is the decision of boards. The board, the board has already decided and approved this file. The and, now, yeah. the, and so now that the moving party, KPCR, is asking for that it be overturned. So my, that's my only point is if you, if you would like to see that motion granted, if you mm -hmm. approve of that, if you're in favor of it, that's how you speak. In favor of what? Then that's say, okay. state in again. favor of the reconsideration. Yeah. Does that make I mean, sense? Yeah. We've got a whole yeah. list out there of people that signed say, up. Okay. So okay. Let me. If it's if it's backwards, it doesn't matter. It's backwards. Just, just we get up and say we, we get the general idea. We'll know. We'll yeah. know by your comments what your position is. So. <laughs> Obviously, that one. Didn't go. So raise your hands again if you want to speak because I want to. I'm trying to decide how I want to do this. So it doesn't look like everyone. So why don't we start in the front row here and we'll just go row by row. Yeah, that's fine. We'll go row by row for those that wish to speak. Make sure you identify your name for the record. Um, and again, I want to remind you, keep it to the impact um, that we've been, been discussing. So uh, if you get, if you stray off the impact, I will stop you and have and redirect you. So we're looking for adverse impact for um, for this political subdivision or political subdivision for public services. Okay, do you want me here, Jesse, or do you want me over there? You can you can go wherever you'd like. Okay. I would rather stand here because then I can see Sure, everybody. for sure. Thank you. Yeah, and again, don't forget to identify yourself. Sorry. All right. My name is Christina Kingsland. I live at 275 South Thimbleberry Lane, and I'm one of the 28 people who signed on to this reconsideration. Um, I brought a special gift for Dan McDonald because, Dan, you didn't get enough well logs last time yeah, and that. i know how much you like them so i That's think awesome. i brought you 32 okay. and i won't bore everybody with 32 well logs but i would like to um speak to the odin water issue um, my family uh moved to bonner county in 76 we moved to the selly valley in in 1980 and we were uh we have had many own water hookups in our owning a property in the valley so thank you to odin water it's a great system as uh, Nathan said, at this point in time, they're not offering hookups. So I said, well, if it's not, you know, if we're not going to provide water in that way, how are, would we move forward? Whether we're talking infill lots in areas that are already 20 acre minimums, but are not developed or in infill lots in areas that are 10 acre minimums that are not fully developed out, let alone taking an area that's 20 acre minimum and switching it over to a 10 acre minimum. Um, I pulled, well, let me see. I, I would like to start with just three pieces of anecdotal information because everything kind of starts there. So I'll say that, you know, 20, oh, my husband bought the property that we live on in 1989. We moved out there in 2000. We we're just a couple of kids building it out of the trees that the lumber that we milled from our trees and we actually moved there before we had a well. We put in 2,800 gallons of cistern. But then we drilled a well in 2001, but we like to grow a garden and we got about a gallon and a half a minute out of that well. So we drilled another well in 2003. We went down, we went from 350 feet to 440. We actually got a lower amount of water on our well log, but we ended up with more water. And then in 2006, we expanded our garden a little so we hired a hydrogeologist and we drilled another well, 400 feet in granite, and we got no water. It was a Friday night. The well drillers took pity on us. So they said, we'll come back on Monday and we'll, we won't charge you another setup fee. So we, they drilled again the, on Monday and we got a well 250 feet with about a gallon and a half. So we have played that game between uh, cisterns, two active wells, solar power, a garden that needs 1200 gallons every day in the summertime. And it's a, it's a fun game, keeps you connected to the earth. I'm not complaining about it, but it will, but it's a little bit concerning. So as, as a realtor, I have had the opportunity of selling other homes in my neighborhood. I did not sell 2121 Thimbleberry, but it's on our road and- Christina, can you have a second? Yeah. Does anybody wish to give Christina their time? Okay, you too. Okay, so Christina, please try to speak to the public services, the impact on public services. That's what we're here okay. to talk about. There is no public service of water. Right. 
So I, I feel that it's relevant. I hope that you feel that it's relevant that a family needs to have water. Oh, sure. So without public service, then what do we have? We have private drilled wells. So I, I hope that you're finding it relevant and I speed me along if I'm. Well, if I can help. So, <laughs> so, so the, family... the, rea the reality of this is that too, is that let's say, let's say we decide to uphold this and they eventually do want to develop it. They do develop it. They can't get water. They can't develop it. So there's no relevancy with respect to wells at this point with what we're taking up here. So I, I, um, and even if Odin water decided to serve that area and they, but they said, we don't have any more capacity, we can't service that also would stop any, any further development. So thank we're you. looking for impact on specific on the public agencies. So right now we're going, so I'll skip the anecdote of the dry well around right, the corner you. and I'll skip the anecdote of the 30, two well logs that average out at three gallons a minute. And I'll skip the anecdote of the adjacent property that had a five gallon a minute 1983 well that actually only specked out last year at 2.18 gallons. And I'll move right to the fact that we're in the middle of water adjudication. What is water adjudication? Everybody signing up for the water that they have. So I called my friend, Steve Gill at DEQ and I said, Steve, what is water adjudication? And he said, well, it's kind of like when you go to Cancun with your buddies and you go to the Mexican restaurant and you order one of those big margaritas and everybody puts a straw in it. And if you've got three or four of you, you're going to get pretty drunk. You're going to have a nice drink. If you've got seven or eight, it gets a little smaller. The water that we have is the water that we have. Adjudication doesn't give us more water. What it will give us is it'll give us an opportunity to be first in right and first in time, which I might be in my neighborhood. But in order to get my little bit of water that I live on back, I would have to sue my neighbor, Daniel, I love you, but I need my water. Oh, you're ahead of me. <laughs> but I, you know, I would be taking my water back from someone else. It doesn't give us any more water. So I would ask you, Commissioner McDonald, you know, to think about as we move forward in Bonner County, this, Mr. Skinner's already said he doesn't want to do anything with this. So it isn't about him, but it's about all of us, the infill, what services we don't have and what services we need. And the bottom line is right now, we don't know what water we have. We will know a lot more in a couple of years when the adjudication is going through that's what that process is all about so if we i so i encourage not making decisions based on unknown information that can have really big impacts on people's lives and then i would say that we can see evidence of challenges in water with water in bonner county by the fact that we just you commissioners just voted for arrowhead ranch in Kokolala to be a disaster zone so that Department of Environmental Quality, DQ, could start spending money, which they've already committed at least $20,000 to that program to investigate finding more water. $300,000 just went to Odin View Estates, which is a small development that was uh, built in the 90s. She's got three more minutes because we had two people volunteer. So the problem, so, Christina, and, and I don't want to be critical, but we're, we're really looking at the possible impact this would have on the surrounding parcels. That's what that's what our focus is. That's what we're here to do. And um, so well, honestly, with could, respect to public provided services, we're not again water. If if they can't get water, there's no water available. Then there's no development. It's pretty cut and dry. I mean, that's a big hook. Basically, sewer and water are the two biggest natural limiters. So. Right. All the discussion about water, I, I just kind of feel like you're wasting your time because we're not sticking to the subject. I'm going to get more strict about it. Is it's got to be right. impact. Well, if you're topics. interested in the surrounding properties, Commissioner Connolly, that's the well logs that you're looking at. Is you've got them right in front of you. And please. please. <laughs> so you you received a comment from IDWR that said if these additional lots were created, they would have a water right. I think what she's speaking to is they may have a water right to have a half an acre of water, mm -hmm. right? But what she's speaking to is, is there water in the ground to accommodate those additional rights? 
There's three wells on that property right now. Again, we're talking about public. Two of service. them show no water. We don't have we don't have any authority over water. Well, I I'm only I apologize. I don't want to be redundant. I tried to bring good facts. No, and I, and I get what I get what you're saying. In this and I'm trying to just. And I don't want to, I don't want to discount your concern. We're just trying to keep this limited to the to the scope in which we outlined at the very beginning. Um, and and again, we don't regulate water. We don't give well permits. We don't do any of that. The promises that we make for the future our promises for the future. It, it is buyer beware, but have you ever invested $40,000 on a piece of property you don't own to be sure that there's a well there? We've already made a lot of promises that I hope we can keep. So let's not make more that we can. Okay, Thank you. thanks Christine. Okay, Don, go ahead. Did you want to, you were next, do you want to go? Well, I'm gonna go after you. Okay. Um, somebody could donate a little time to me, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to start with uh, something I say at the end of my presentation, and that is we in Bonner County will be challenged enough with the development that is and will occur in the future under present day zoning ordinances. I'll say that several times tonight. I think it's important. But I guess we find out today if we're turning the corner on rubber stamping of applications for higher density in our rural open space county by our planning departments and commissioners. Pete Bonner County Rural's motion to reconsider lists nine reasons for reconsideration, only one of which we are allowed to talk about today. Hopefully these additional eight other reasons won't be addressed in the future. According to drought.gov, the Selly Valley is described as D1, moderate drought characterized by lower hay and grain crop yields, well level declines, water shortages can occur, water conservation programs can occur, fire risk is elevated, fires spread easily. Question, what is the carrying capacity of water in the Sally Valley? We don't know. We understand it's finite. We know we have water for our homes, farms, ranches, through our wells, excluding those that are on Odin water. Some wells are challenged, some are not. Northside School, who drilled a well in 1977, was on that well until 1999 and had to petition Odin Water because that well, although it was good for around 20 years, went bad because of bacteria and too much iron. So having a well is not a dependable thing, at least in this area, on a school that was <clears throat> Records were kept and tests were made on a regular basis. Okay, where is the threshold for taking too much water from the ground? Nobody knows. Are there warning signs? Yes. I spoke with Dan Sturgis from the Idaho Department of Water Resources. He's the lead hydrogeologist for the North Idaho region. I spoke to him on April 18th and asked for information on groundwater in the Sally Valley. They currently do not have info on groundwater in this area. Dan Sturgis hopes to hire new staff this summer to begin groundwater surveys in Bonner and Boundary County. So these questions can be better understood and dealt with. Now is not the time to double the density on zoning. Fish and Game <clears throat> environmental biologist Merritt Horsman wrote his agency's response for this application. This application that intends to increase density. I'm just gonna read an excerpt uh, from his three page letter, which really wasn't even summarized by the planning department. With, and this, this is concerning the Pack River. This is an excerpt from his three pages. With increased development in this area, important it is, is an important migration corridor is likely to see additional negative effects, which may have consequences for native fish conservation and the world-class fishery currently available in Lake Pend Oreille. Climate models predict less snowpack, earlier spring runoff, and high summer temperatures will occur with increasing frequency in the future. The results of groundwater pumping are likely to be the greatest concern during these periods of low flow, particularly when the reliability 
of surface water supplies is threatened through droughts. Merritt writes, we are concerned that an increase in residential water use and proximity to the Pack River may have negative effects on the amount of surface water available to provide a migratory corridor for fish. Once again, we'll be challenged enough with development on our present day zoning ordinances. It's no time to double the density. It's time for our commissioners to restore the confidence the Bonner County citizens deserve and their elected leaders by considering the future effects of rezoning to higher density before allowing that rezoning to occur. What we're doing today is a good first step. I know that we in Keep Bonner County Rural and the thousands that have joined and support us, supported us, believe that we will be challenged enough with the development that is and will occur in the future under the present day zoning ordinances. Again, let's no longer make our land use ordinances a facade or an illusion easily breached for the benefit of an individual and not the general welfare of a community. Thank you. Good. Make sure you identify yourself for the record. My name is Patrick Myers. I live on Thimbleberry Lane, 1126 Thimbleberry. Three of the parcels uh, in the uh, application from the Skinners are adjacent to my property. Um, I'm going to read uh, most of what I had submitted on April 20th to the commissioners. Uh, there's a section there that I'll skip over. Um, the, the three parcels that are there are inaccessible for several months of the year, as uh, Sheriff Wheeler's letter noted. During the winter months, unless someone living farther around Thimbleberry plows the road, passage to these properties is inaccessible after snowstorms. And further, during the spring, the, uh, the road is very muddy and inaccessible for several weeks. Uh, Thimbleberry does a loop around the hill, but in the uh, wintertime, there's a very steep section on the south side that cannot be accessed. Um, and then in the springtime, that section uh, around the south actually has a lake in the in the southeast corner uh, as well um, in the property that Chris mentioned as well. Um, I have I had submitted in the uh, April 20th a couple of uh, pictures, one with mud and one of the lake that's several hundred feet long in the middle of the road. So if you can't get around the north side to get to these properties, you also can't get around the south side because of the lake that's there. So emergency vehicles cannot get to the, those properties um, if there's any development on them now. Um, in addition to um, the letter that Sheriff Wheeler noted, I did submit uh, a couple of photos and I'll, I'll skip those. And if you're following in the book, uh, maybe not, but um, go to the last page. I've got a couple other things to say there. Um, some of the, the, residences who, the residents who lived on the uh, east and southeast side of Thimbleberry, in the winter time would either park at and start of my driveway on the north side and walk in or ski in or snowmobile in because they couldn't access it with their vehicles um, and in other cases they would actually go up red cedar lane from lower pack river road and walk to their homes because they could not get there by vehicles these same parcels uh, parcels f1 f2 and h are in that uh, same range that would be inaccessible I'm going to skip the uh, the part of my submittal from April 20th about the, the land uh, that was very steep um, over the 30% because we're not supposed to talk about that in this uh, submittal today. A couple other points I want to make. Um, on Tom Albertson, who's the LPO SD superintendent, I spoke with him on the phone and uh, he had stated that any significant increase in enrollment would require more portable classrooms or other expansion options at Northside School where they're now 180 students and they're using the both of the portable classrooms as mentioned earlier today. Um, expansion on the ground is very limited. If the Skinner properties were to, to be divided into 20 acre parcels, those homes could easily overload the school. If the expansion were doubled to the AF10 zoning, then there's a risk that we would lose Northside School altogether because of the limited expansion space on the site. We do not want to lose our, our rural school that has been in operation for at least 60 years. Uh, I went there in the 60s myself when it was uh, eight grades there in four classrooms. Um, and I think with 
North Side, Sago, South Side, other rural schools, you know, I think all of us in the room either have gone to some of those schools or don't want to have to be bused to town, to Sandpoint, to a school that would probably have to be built again and in increase the burden on the taxpayers for uh, additional schools to be developed. Another comment about uh, that I want to talk about is the road and bridge comments from on April 8th from Matt Mulder. It was not summarized in the in the, uh, what was presented earlier today, but you noted that the limited parking at Northside is already a problem and will get worse, including parents queuing up on the main roads as more students are added to the school. He also mentioned the concern about development on the parcels access via substandard Red Cedar Lane, and they would propose that privately maintained roads to be brought up to county standards if the development were to take place there. Um, I did like the the comment made earlier um, that the postpone the upzoning. Your time is up. You may have given me a few minutes. I'm almost done. Time and hasn't given time already. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm almost thank done. Thank you. Um, if if a development plan is to be brought together, make the decision at that time. You know, I like the idea of of denying the AF10 zoning at this time and wait and see what happens later with any development plan. Uh, Preston noted that the board decision is discretionary. The people do not want this. And I am wondering why the commissioners might want to vote against the will of the people. That's it for me, thank you. Okay, thank you, Pedro. Um, Susan, you're next. Glasses. My comments, I think, are really close to three minutes, but I might need like one more minute. Can you see those yeah, you need to add them to where's the other she is. Here. Thank you for holding this reconsideration hearing. Um, you've now heard many legitimate concerns about the ability to adequately serve the property if it's developed into 20 home sites. And there's every reason to believe that it will be subdivided and developed if rezoned. Don't forget that the cost to provide schools and teachers and roads, and road maintenance and emergency services primarily falls on the local taxpayers. Land use decisions have an impact on our county's pocketbook. They're like decisions with investing and how many of you would invest your money in a company that just loses money? Well, that's exactly what the county is doing when it allows density to increase in rural areas like this. This is well established from the work of people like Charles Marone of Strong Towns and Joe Minicazzi, a nationally renowned planning consultant, both of whom are considered experts on the fiscal impacts of land use and development. Both were featured in a series of educational webinars developed recently by Future West, which is a nonprofit based in Montana. And I'd encourage anyone to, interested in these land use issues to check it out. Um, Future West's mission is to help communities identify, choose, and achieve their desired futures. By the way, I'm Susan Drumheller. I live in Sagal, Idaho. I'm on the board of Project 7B. I'm not actually speaking for Project 7B, but um, we're a group that would love to be like Future West. I mean, they're, they're one of the great organizations out there doing land use work. Joe Minikazi's consulting firm does true cost accounting with regard to taxation with the goal to help communities develop functional budgets and financially sustainable futures. While much of their work has been in cities, they've done several studies in Western counties such as Teton County, Idaho, Gallatin County, Montana, and Mesa County, Colorado. <clears throat> I gave you a map of the communities, towns, and counties around the country where they've done these analyses. The second page shows the average property value per square foot for counties, for cities, for malls, and then for mixed use developments of different densities. The county average was $1 per square foot. Cities were $5.50 per square foot. And the mixed use two-story buildings are worth $47.80 per square foot. The upshot shows that not only do governments subsidize single family homes, but the expense to revenue ratio just gets worse with the more sprawl that you have. That's because you have to provide roads and emergency services and 
schools, et cetera, to a larger area. We're here to talk about the adverse impact of delivery. This is, this is an adverse impact on the property. It's on the county and on the property taxpayers. Well, no. And yeah, I know. Specific to the roads, schools. schools. Those are county costs. Yes, this is paid for by the county okay. taxpayers. Go ahead, carry on. It's close. And, it, and it's, it's the close. neighbors are impacted too. I would, in Eugene, Oregon, the subsidy per acre for single family homes is $1,400. I believe Bonner County needs to do one of these analyses before allowing more upzoning like this in our rural and ag forest areas. Then we can see where the county is losing money and where it might actually make sense to increase density. This would be a great analysis to do as part of the comprehensive plan update. Let's figure out where the county could actually grow the community's wealth and not overburden taxpayers. I suspect we would find it makes no sense to increase density here next to Northside School on what has served as an agricultural and forest land for decades. What this does is turn our former agricultural areas into subdivisions that need more services. And I'm gonna steal and localize a quip from Minakazi's presentation by noting that a bale of hay or a cow are not gonna call the Sheriff's Department or EMS. We also should look at the big picture. Each time you allow an up zone, it creates a domino effect, just compounding these unsustainable financial trends. Eventually the county is going to need major road improvements in that area. Col Colburn Culver Road is in the middle of a week in the middle of a weekday is getting quite busy. I rode my bike on it yesterday, um, like about one o'clock is super busy. Furthermore, this trend of turning our rural agricultural and forest lands into big subdivisions. Ultimately, it takes the land out of production and the community might desperately need local agricultural production in the future, not to mention wildlife corridors and clean water. So this idea of there's always the option to increase density down the road, but you can't reverse your decision if you allow it now. The value of protecting those future needs is hard to quantify. The experts in this kind of fiscal analysis conclude that short-term growth only creates an illusion of prosperity at the expense of a community's long-term solvency. The only people who benefit from this situation are the landowners who profit greatly when they subdivide and sell the property, in this case, the Otis's and Skinner's. By denying this rezone, you still allow the owners their rightful enjoyment of their property and their free choice to keep or sell their land or subdivide at the current density. They'll still make a killing. But if you allow the rezone, the applicants will simply double their profits at the expense of the county taxpayers now and well into the future. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Nobody in that row. Maureen, you didn't raise your hand to give your time away. Did you want to speak? Okay. They can stand there if they want. Yeah, you don't have to go to, you don't have to, go to the podium if you don't want to. We're, oh, I can stand here? Okay. Thanks. Maureen Patterson for the record. So the 2008 comprehensive plan was put together over many years with input from the community. They were trying to take into account the safety of the community and the preservation of our natural resources. We need to support the forethought and planning that was done. It's difficult to know the capacity of water in the Silly Valley or exactly what the effect of doubling the traffic on the road. We know, I noted that uh, Road and Bridge didn't say how much traffic they have now, and they have sensors on, on the roads. So what is that information? So the land use laws uh, need with low densities as we have now is our only protection against burdening these resources. This is why planning and zoning recommended a denial. We don't want higher traffic volumes, overcrowded schools, law enforcement um, infrastructure stretched thin, dried up wells, etc. Please keep the zoning in accordance with the comprehensive plan, those zoning laws, to 20 acre parcels and do not double the density uh, pursue sufficient information and services to these legitimate concerns, please. Give me your time to give you more time. Asia? Wow, that's short. Asia Williams, uh, Blanchard, Idaho. So in Title 12, 215, it clearly gives the opportunity for us to do more work than we've done on this file. 
The subsection says that any other information considered by planning director or governing body to be necessary for complete evaluation of the proposal, such as information regarding utilities, traffic, service, connections, and natural resources. So the current board is saying that we can address water in the subdivision phase, but Title 12 gives us the opportunity to take the step farther and do it in the zoning phase. And so since the Skinners aren't actually looking for a project right now, they just want to return to something, what is the harm in the commissioners using that subsection and saying we're going to consider that impact? I messaged this over to Milton during this original hearing and the response was, I understand the point, but that section is optional, which means we have the option to future plan for that impact instead of changing the zone, increasing the density when we can't go backward. And so the response from planning was if they came back, if IDWR came back with a comment that there was a concern with water in the area, then you could require additional. That's true, but we can require it now in the zone change chapter. And so I would request that the commissioners consider future planning of the increased density. The other thing that was mentioned was schools. It's not enough to say we can pull out another storage container. You need teachers. And the county has already identified that employment is an issue in the county. So where are we going to get the teachers to teach if we increase the density? And so there's no rush to do it based on the presentation of the Skinners. So let's do future planning on this decision because schools will be negatively impacted just by increasing the number of students, which also means that we have to find people to work in the schools. We're not prepared to do that. We haven't done that future planning, but Title 12 gives you the legal right to do that at this level. Okay. Thank you for your time. You wanna speak? Young lady? No? Okay. Just wanna give Let's see. Amy, you gave away your time. You two, either one of you two wanna speak? Some water. I don't have I don't have cooties. I promise. Um, let's go. I'm going to go by row, so it makes it much simpler. Um, let's start um, behind. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Did you want to speak? Oh, okay. So then, right behind you, the guy with the fish hook on his hat. You want to speak? Okay. Um, sir, next to you. How about you, ma'am? You? Nope. Through the end of that road, Dan. Why don't you go ahead? You got six minutes. I don't know. If it's okay. That kind of answers my question. But it was there. Um, he's, got, he's got six minutes, Jake. You got to give him this time. Yeah, I'll, I'll reset it. Up. Okay. Yep. Uh, my name is Dan Rose. Uh, first, I'm going to speak privately and then I'll speak as my elected position. Um, I've had the conversation with other one other person in this race, um, or the commissioner's race, about this issue. And I said before, previously at testimonies, for the Skinners that I empathize, empathize with their property rights. And the conversation I've had um, is kind of similar to where I just came from. That was the adjudication hearing, which was mentioned a, mi a minute ago, which is uh, right in time. To me, uh, a comp plan of right and purchase, when you know exactly what you're buying at that point in time is fairly indicative of what you should expect. I don't know if it's possible, but it should be looked at pretty severely. And I would say that the adjudication process would lend credence to that effort. Um, I live a few miles north of the North Side School, probably about six miles. I travel that Coburn Culver section of the road regularly. It is true that there is often times at school events, no place to put your car in that parking lot. And it does affect uh, the issues on the road just visibility coming out of um, rapid lightning would, would indicate that. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the uh, official side of the house now. I welcome the BOCC's motion to ensure that quote, as it was written in the paper, consideration has been given to the effects of the proposed zone change on the delivery of services by any political subdivision, which the Penderley Hospital Taxing District is, providing public services. And we provide three services at the Taxing District. It is um, Sandpoint Women's Health, which is birthing, it is behavioral health, and it is ENT, which is probably across all ages, but you might have that related to seniors as well. 
depending on what type of product, uh, what type of development goes there, would depend on um, what type of services the hospital district might have to consider. I have to ask why not also the political subdivision of the Penderley Hospital District. I heard many others mentioned, but I did not hear the Penderley Hospital District. Um, I'm inquiring to actually who was notified at the Penderley Hospital District. Um, I spoke on this very issue previously at a regular business meeting on this very subject hearing. As you might recall, I offered to the county, be it planning, be it uh, the planning commission, or the commissioners to send these requests for participation in rezone processes to the accountable, accountable elected officials of those different organizations and not just the administry, the agency administrator who might just throw it in the desk. And then the other elected officials have no idea that they were even consulted. I can represent to the BOCC today as an elected PhD trustee that I have neither ever received notice from the POHD chair, the POHD secretary, and have not ever seen on our scheduled public agendas any item that references discussion of this rezone issue. Or that would ask the POHD to respond to the impact that it might have on the rezone. I would suggest that if LUPA processes to honor state language, the process, at least as far as the Penderley Hospital District's participation, is at best incomplete and at worst has failed. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, go ahead, and the purple will go this way. Huh? What? You, you need to come over to a microphone, ma'am. Sorry. You can. Well, it's for us. It's for the recording because everything's being recorded. You you will live on forever. Sorry. In the county public records. Yeah, we call it Ponderay around. Yeah, it's Ponderay. <laughs> At least that's what we Denderlay. call it. Um, I've been oh. a resident in Bonner County for nearly 35 years. So what was your name again, ma'am? Maria Albergado. Okay. I live a mile and a half from Northside Fire. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that although these men, I don't know if we have any women yet, um, are dedicated people. We lost a house to a fire in 1993 because they couldn't get enough people to the firehouse in time. There wasn't enough water in the pumpers to put the fire out. And then in 2015, we had a second house fire. And thank goodness, the fire department was actually doing maintenance and arrived in 15 minutes and saved the house. So, I give you gentlemen and I, my hats off to you truly and with gratitude, um, but this is real. Uh, six years ago, one of my neighbors set fire to a large swath of the valley accidentally by not attending to a slash pile that required the Department of Lands to respond. So water and fire together are huge for us. Those of us who live in the valley know, we know we take our chances. Sometimes the EMTs make it to us in time and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the fire department arrives and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have enough water for your garden and sometimes you don't. That's part of rural living. But they are things I think that truly need consideration. And I think it's worth taking the time to look at this issue again, whether it's Mr. Skinner's property or anyone else's, because there are still large tracts of land in Bonner County that could be rezoned and could be developed. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Maria. Oh, let's go. How about you, you're standing up. Nope, okay, let's go to the gentleman right there. You wish to speak? How about the lady next to you? No? Carol? Yeah. Wait, she may not want to. Hold on. Cheryl, do you want to speak? You want to speak? No, no. Okay, I'm here as a private citizen, Cheryl Cans, and I live in the Sully Valley. 
So since the attorneys brought this up, um, uh, the the, re, the rezoning uh, from a 10 acre to, or he wants it to go back to 10 acres, what it was when he bought it. For us natives in the area, I can go back before 1978. So does that mean that I can do whatever I want? Or does zoning mean something? Does a comprehensive plan mean something? Besides that, I believe that the law enforcement is a public service and an important one. And it affects this whole county. So I think you need to consider the cumulative effect, among other things, of the traffic from the cumulative growth um, and that we don't have the infrastructure for this kind of growth that we're, we're experiencing now. I, had, I can say from personal experience, it used to take me 10 minutes to go from my house to the sheriff's office, not speeding. <laughs> However, I have been up to 20 minutes going through Kootenai and I, there was no accident. Stop and go traffic over 20 minutes. That's ridiculous for North Idaho. Okay. And when you consider law enforcement and what's being cumulatively impacted, we have the jail, we have dispatch, we have patrol, we have Marines, we have detectives, we have evidence, we have records, we have driver's license, we have search and rescue. All of those are impacted. You as a community are impacted by those services or lack thereof. There's also the increase of accidents, thefts, drugs, assaults, other crimes, et cetera. And that's, I think you need to consider the cumulative impact of all this growth you've put upon us. Plus, what is the reason for a comprehensive plan and zoning? That's what we're asking you to honor. That's what I ask. Vivian, you want to speak? I'll speak. Go ahead. I don't have to worry about telling you to identify yourself with the record. You're running for office, so you're automatic. You're automatically going to do that. <laughs> well, anyway, Dave Bowman, Selly Valley, for the record. Uh, I'm going to start with something I almost never do. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for agreeing to this reconsideration, and again for <laughs> well, seriously, and for agreeing to That's continue. Sure. That was uh, being reasonable. Yeah, I wish we could have been in the bigger room. But. It might might happen again someday. Anyway, uh, rezones can't be separated from public services, uh, and this application is particularly important in regard to public services. So by recently submitting your own code amendment, application AM00622, you have already acknowledged that not addressing public services at the time of applying for a rezone is an issue that needs to be corrected. AM00622, while largely symbolic, proves that you understand rezones have an adverse effect on public services and therefore an adverse effect on neighbors and often on <clears throat> people in the county at large. Public services are one of the primary responsibilities of commissioners, and that responsibility, it's to the people, not to selected property owners for their personal financial gain. Residents of this county have let it be known repeatedly that they do not want their county to become burdened with irresponsible growth. What is irresponsible growth? Well, that would be growth with no consideration of the effects of that growth upon the people you are serve, again, on the public services you are tasked with protecting. LUPA 67-6511 states, particular consideration shall be given to the effects of any proposed zone change upon the delivery of services by any political subdivision providing public services including school districts, within the planning jurisdiction. Webster's defines particular as distinctive among other examples or cases of the same general category, notably unusual. Job of government is to protect the health, safety, and general welfare, welfare excuse me, of its residents. Welfare is defined in Webster's as a state of doing well, especially in respect to good fortune, happiness, well-being, well or prosperity. Remember, you as commissioners have extremely broad discretion. No court is ever going to hold it against you for ruling in accordance with the Planning and Zoning Commission's findings of fact and conclusions of law, and they're certainly not going to hold it against you for complying with LUPA. 
I ask that you uphold the law today as is your sworn duty, deny this application. All I got. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? Hi, my name is Susan Bowman. For the record, I live in Selly Valley. I wanna start by thanking the commissioners for this reconsideration today. Utilizing good land use planning practices is the best defense against overloading our public services. I can say without a doubt, allowing rezones such as this application cannot be called good land use planning. Planners create zoning districts based on gathering varying types of data, but especially data on the public services because the central tenet of county government is to provide public services. It is clear that adequate data has not been gathered for this application, nor was it submitted as part of the application. For example, how much traffic will the extra lots that they are approving with the rezone create? Would that extra traffic require a traffic light? Should the taxpayers have to pay for that traffic light? We don't know because that wasn't analyzed. With no analysis, it can't possibly be said that public services are being given particular consideration. Planning is important because it carries out the vision of the people. The people created a comprehensive plan and spoke very clearly that they want to remain rural. This is accomplished by creating and maintaining larger lot sizes. The people's vision of maintaining rural character is woven throughout the entire comp plan, but you wouldn't know that by reading the staff reports because the comp plan is essentially ignored by the planning department. But the Planning and Zoning Commission did read the comp plan and did analyze it against th this application, which is required by Title 12 in order to accomplish a zoning map change. In the PNZ conclusion of law, they recommended to you that you deny the application because it, quote, is not in accordance with the following elements of the comprehensive plan, land use, implementation, natural resources, transportation, school facilities, transportation, and public services. If a PNZ makes such a recommendation, that recommendation should then be analyzed by planning staff in their staff report so that the board can understand how these elements were not followed by the applicant. This aids the board in making their final decision. Instead, staff ignored these comp plan elements with the exception of public services, but even in their analysis of that, did not go the distance to actually analyze any data to determine if in fact public services would be affected. Just asking public agencies for their comments on a proposal is not analysis of public services and can in no way be considered giving it Particular, particular consideration. The PNZ denied this application because it is not in accordance, I'm almost done, uh, not in accordance with six, six comp plan okay, elements. Uh, so the, the PNZ denied this application because it's not in accordance with the comp plan, six elements. The planning staff ignored five of these elements and did not fully analyze public services. The board then made their decision based at least in part on the staff so-called analysis. I'm asking you to reconsider this information by denying this application. The 16 page appeal letter that we submitted has many other items that show clearly the decision was made in error. Please don't make our constituents sue the county because the planning staff did not do their job properly. Today, you have the chance to correct a decision made in error that is based on incomplete information. I ask you to deny this application that is not in accordance with our comp plan. So just be clear, you want us to deny I want you to. The you know what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure because I know it's upside down. Then. Did you yeah. sides again? No, no, no. It made me chuckle because I was going. Wait a minute! I thought she was arguing. One hundred percent denial. Yeah. <laughs> um, we better make sure that that any if there's anybody in the hallway who wants to speak as well. We yeah. Are there sure people in the hallway? Right? No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, right. Ma'am, uh, next Susan. Nope. What are I, I've already stated. Do you okay. want any more questions, concerns from? Yeah, no. Um, nobody else. Chief, do you want to talk? Okay. So rebuttal. We go to rebuttal too on this. Go back to press. Go back to Mr. Carter. Okay. Sure. Oh, anyway, okay. Sorry. Anybody there wants to talk? I got one hand up, Christine. 
Christine. I'm sitting on the left Okay, go ahead and light them up one by one. Make sure they make sure you identify your name for the record. Can you muted on your end? You pull them up so I can see. Got them over there. I, I don't have them. Oh. Hello. Hello, go. Christine. Can you hear us? Yes, this is Christine Logue from Blanchard, Idaho. And I was just listening in on all of these things. And I do thank you for reconsidering this. Um, one of the concerns that just keeps sticking out over and over again is the fact that um, the applicant continues to say that they hadn't been notified. And in our specific area, that's always been an issue. Well, it's it, we've been told several times that it is our responsibility to know what's going on. So I just wanted to make that comment and also just um, further to encourage you guys to look at the, the, the project as a whole, the area, um, you know, I grew up as my dad taking us up for Sunday drives in the Pack River and just seeing the wildlife and, you know, listening to the water preservation um, issues. Um, you know, let's protect this, this, this land and, and also uh, respect this person's um, property right. You know, it's like one of the ladies had commented, you know, you can't, if she wanted to go back and make it what it was in the seventies, you know, let's think about that. Let's, let's think about that in consideration as well. I thank you for your time. And I hope that you guys do not approve uh, this reason. Thank you. Who's next? Jeremy Grimm, do you want to speak? Yes, thanks, Commissioner Jeremy <laughs> Grimm, professional planner, Whiskey Rock Planning. Um, I'm neutral on this, uh, Chairman McDonald, so um, uh, that's probably... We found, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, we found someone who's neutral? Well, uh, I work Never with happens. developers and others, so uh, I did just want to point out um, that in the interest of making the best decision you can, and I know you have a challenging decision, um, the August 24th, 2021 agency notification letter failed to notice the Idaho Department of Transportation. And the reason I think that's, um, you know, interesting is because uh, there's this downstream effect to traffic generation from any future development there um, that arguably you could address uh, when a subdivision comes through for this property or these parcels. But um, when you look at trip generation for single family homes, it's about 10 trips per home. So in theory, we're looking at maybe 750 trips to be generated if this were built out at full density. Um, those trips end up uh, really being uh, focused during something they call peak hours. And the majority of those trips, uh, as we all know, are gonna end up at Shingle Mill, Colburn, or um, uh, Selly there on 95. And, you know, uh, ITD may want to have a comment on the potential uh, impact of trip generation from a project. Now, whether you address that at uh, the subdivision phase or now, uh, I just want to point that out because um, it, it may be a, an opportunity to table this until you hear from ITD, just so you cover your basis and you're not extending this, uh, you know, deliberation decision forever. You could just, you know, conclude it with every agency that may have an effect uh, or be affected by this uh, potential uh, rezone. So um, that's all I wanted to say and good luck. Okay. Thanks, Jeremy. Who's next? Teresa. Teresa. Hello, this is Teresa Heisner, priest. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to recommend denial for this application. I feel like Mr. Skinner's had, what, 14 years to figure out that his property has been rezoned. And a real brief comment, EMS and law enforcement go hand in hand. Law enforcement cannot even enforce our radar around here. And with the traffic increases, listen to the scanner on any given night. It's traffic accident after traffic accident. Crime is on the rise. Please be a little more careful in your decision making. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else in line? Shauna. Shauna, can you hear us? Hello, Jonna. Hang on, sir. Oh. Jonna, can you hear us? Okay. 
Okay, so I think we've got everybody covered here. Everybody covered there. I have a question, Bill. What about Idaho Department of Transportation? Um, do we need to take that up? Yeah, deliberation. We're in it right now. Probably. Well, because I, I had that same question. Yeah. As a matter of fact, because I think that. Well, well let's go ahead and uh, if you guys want to close public comment, and then during your deliberation, oh, well, then you we have to do jump it around back. John wants to go. John is back on. Okay. Well, we still have to. We still have to listen to Preston. Yeah, we have to listen to Preston first. Okay, we'll come back to it. Yeah. So, Jonna. Thank you for letting me back on. This is Jonna Plant Sagel, and I just wanted um, to make sure, and hopefully, you'll pay attention to the land use attorney, Preston Carter. Um, we don't want to have to pay double payments or double where we have to sue and then we also have to pay Bill Wilson to defend you. <laughs> so we're back to that. I just really want you to listen to land use attorney. By the way, Givens personally wrote the Idaho land use handbook. I think that's pretty important that he knows the law. And um, so that's what I'm saying. Please follow the law and uh, keep the district zoning districts what they are, 20 acre minimum in Silly Valley. Thank you. Okay. okay, now Preston, back to you for a bubble. Okay, great. Uh, can you guys can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. But please make sure you continue to speak up. You last time you were kind of fading off a little bit. Okay, so you're finally well, getting old. His hearing's challenge. Huh. No worries. Um, okay, so real quickly, just in response to to Mr. Finney's comments, um, as the board uh, and others noted, Christina and others joined on the reconsideration. Got um, a little more. There are affected persons. Um, this one's confusing. Mr. Finney stated that the, the reason for the application was to return to prior zoning. I heard that and I spent looking the rest of the time looking at the record and here's what the application says. Explain in detail the reason for the zone change to allow the landowners to have usable options for the parcel similar to surrounding areas. The returning to prior zoning was not mentioned and that's not the basis for the application. Um, Mr. Finney says you can go back in zoning. He says that's what happened to him. So sort of my point is in, con in the context of a, well, okay. My point is this, we talk a lot about property rights, which is absolutely correct and warranted. You have a property right in your current zoning. So if the applicant is up zoned and later comes in with a subdivision and recall that in the county's prior decision, the evaluation of impacts basically said impacts are better evaluated at the subdivision phase. If there's an up zone and the applicant comes back with a subdivision application, they have a property right in the density of their current zoning. And so you cannot go backwards in that context. And so the decision that is made today about the impacts of the zoning on services will be binding for whatever subdivision application is filed in the future. Again, my point, you can my point was not you can never go backwards. My point is the decision today will give the applicant a property right in the zoning that will apply at the subdivision phase. Um, just turning back quickly to summarize, I mean, the board has a mandatory statutory duty to give particular consideration to the effects of any proposed zone change upon the delivery of services by any person. you speak up, Preston. Sure. I was just quoting the statute. Particular consideration shall be given mandatory duty to the effects of any proposed zone change upon the delivery of services by any political subdivision. We've got to look at the record. What will the impacts of this zoning decision be on services? We don't know. We have a handful of comments from public agencies. We have on the record, the fire district stating that it does not know what the impacts will be because it doesn't have sufficient information. There's no analysis. There are no reports. There's no even attempt to quantify what that impact will be. And that's on the sheriff, that's on the fire department, that's on the roads, that's on the hospitals, that's on water. Now I'll return to the fire district. Uh, the fire district had, had really good comments and that was a process that would be followed to determine what the impacts would be on, on its ability to provide services. 
and it would talk with the applicant, understand what's being proposed. And then I would also say that provides the opportunity for the impacts to be mitigated or addressed. That is the process that should go on before the decision to upzone is made. Now, that can be done in a couple of ways. One would be the applicant coming back with a rezone with more information, or that could be done with the applicant coming back with an actual development proposal when the circumstances, A, the circumstances are closer in time to the development, and B, the county would know what that actual proposal is. And, and my question is, why would we make a decision now when we know we can make the same division with decision with more information later? There's no compelling reason to make this discretionary decision now. In fact, I would argue it's the district, or excuse me, the, the board lacks sufficient information on the current record to give particular consideration upon the delivery of services. At the very least, it's more prudent to make the same decision with the same options when more information is known. There's no good reason to make the decision now. We should make it in the future. And for that reason, the request for reconsideration should be granted. The applicant can refile with more information or with a development proposal, and we can make a better decision that's more clearly in line with the legal standards when all the information is known at the appropriate time. Aiden? Yes. Okay, great, thanks, Preston. Okay, we'll go ahead and close any further public comment. Okay, now let's deal with the issue with Idaho Department of Transportation. Uh, Commissioners, Mount Mollerton for the record. So the Idaho Transportation Department, similar to the Lake Ponderé Hospital District, they're all notified uh, as part of the all taxing districts. So they were notified. They were notified, okay. Yeah. We just didn't show them in the record is. That's correct. They, they didn't receive a specific request uh, called agency review, but they did receive notice okay. according, to, according to statute, the required notice. Yep. So okay. for me, Milton, I mean, the, the congestion and stuff that I see, um, you know, other than maybe by the school, which is definitely a problem that is already there, um, you know, when I've talked to Jason about that, um, most of the problems are ITD. And um, for them not to participate in this is it's just a little spooky because, I mean, literally, um, they, if, to me, there seems to be obvious impacts by growth throughout the county, whether it's in the cities or because there's large growth in the cities, obviously. So are you talking about the growth on Colburn Culvert next to the school or are you talking well, about the well, highway? I mean, because the, the road and bridge did provide a, a good they comment. Did. Yeah, they did. I think they did. And they and they did provide um, a written statement of nine point seven vehicle trips per day. Um, somebody had lose <laughs> but they didn't. But yeah, they did. Do that. Correct. Um, can, can I speak just briefly? Absolutely. That <coughs> there's been good argument presented by lots of people here today about the sufficiency of the evidence that's before you guys and whether or not you guys can use that to pay particular attention to the impact on services. So the standard of review, if you guys, and we're probably gonna sue one way or the other, right? Let's assume that happens. Um, the standard review of review is that the court will uphold your decision so long as it is based on substantial competent evidence, even if that evidence is conflicted. So there's contradictory evidence in the record. So just because some might wish that there was more or better evidence in the record, um, doesn't mean that you can't make the decision based on what you have if you believe that it is sufficient for your purposes. And the court will give you great deference for that. Um, so you, that's just a job that you guys have to do, a, a balancing um, to decide if you believe that there has been sufficient evidence provided, you, I would encourage you to, to highlight the stuff that you're going to rely on. Um, and I believe that a court would give you deference so long as you're good about articulating a basis. Um, and that applies to all of these, not just for, for roads, but for all of these um, public services. Well, I think that 
that's a problem I'm struggling with is although Road and Bridge identified the, the problems with the intersection and um, the school, I think the real problem is ITD. I, you know, they said that these roads can handle it. You know, I mean, they they specifically stated it out, and um, I, I'm comfortable with that. But what I'm not comfortable with is ITD not commenting and not bringing anything forward that we can rely on to, to make me say, this isn't gonna add more impact to already an impacted um, road system that apparently at certain times of the day can't handle the traffic as God. Well, but I think the key is, is will, it, will, it, will anything bring more impact? Of course it will, and that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at, we're looking to determine whether or not the impact is going to be of a serious enough nature that the existing infrastructure can't handle it, whatever that infrastructure is. Yeah, but is that for you and I to decide, or is that for somebody like ITD to comment, and and then we mm -hmm. consider that comment on what we think it's, uh, you know. Well, and I, I just, I guess. I, I guess we're not road experts, so right. I would hope that. I know what if I can know what a road looks like. I drive on them every day, right. but I'm not a road expert. I know when I wait three times at a stoplight that mm -hmm. I don't like it. So. Right. Well, I'm, I, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of notes. Okay. Um, I think Northside Fire did a great job of covering it. Um, 25 additional response calls. Um, thank God they do have impact fees. So they, um, if there's something done with this property moving forward, then they would be compensated for that. Um, a couple of little comments. Um, overturning planning and zoning makes it sound like PNZ is an advisory board only, and they may may make a recommendation. It's not an overturning. It's just like you didn't agree with their recommendation. Um, let's see. Property rights given up only. I, I, Bill, I know this is a question for you. When when the attorney says that. You only have property rights when when you leave it in the original parcel form. I disagree wholeheartedly with that. But Saying that you only have the, the legal right, I guess you can clarify. Pro that you only have property rights if you don't um, divide it down. If you don't ask for a, 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 sub a zone change. A zone under, change. Under the I, legal. Think I, I think I interpreted that to mean you have the right to, to split down to your current zoning, but but no, no like guaranteed right to a approval of zone change. Oh, maybe okay. I, maybe yeah, I so did I misunderstand right. what he said then? Perhaps. Okay. Um, but I kind of got the same feeling you got. It's like he was saying that you give up your property, right? When you I when would like you point, change the zone. Mr. Carter highlighted the friction that we're struggling with. Everybody here, you know, for a long time we have talked about addressing these topics at the subdivision stage because that is where our code allows for us to make road requirements and other things of that nature. Um, and yet we have the code section 6511 that tells us that we have to pay particular consideration mm -hmm. or pay attention to this topic. And so, um, although it might be helpful for this discussion to have a, uh, a partner development plan for the property, our code doesn't require that. The Local Land Use Planning Act doesn't require that. Um, so it, although it would be helpful, mm -hmm. um, in order to provide you with more information as to what might happen, um, to, to, to say that, to almost make a de facto rule that the board should deny a rezone request because it is not accompanied by uh, also like a, a proposed subdivision PUD. Um, Application. That, that's a, to me, I don't see that in the law. Um, you still might be able to deny if you, not given sufficient information to make your decision. I just am a little wary about uh, advocating for what would be a de facto rule that you cannot approve a zone change if it doesn't have a corresponding development plan with it, because that's just not a requirement that I see. And I think that is kind of one of the other things. That this, you know, if this, um, is upheld, then it can still be denied it uh, during subdivision if they can't meet the standards. Yeah, for example, for, so for a thimble, thimbleberry lane, the name of the, the dirt road, mm -hmm. um, 
Now, if there was a minor land division on it, and we didn't require a road standard, then there might not be the ability to, to address the road. That is a legitimate concern. Um, but if there was any kind of anything more than that, subdivision or the like, um, then we then that would presumably have to be uh, upgraded to the appropriate standard. Is that correct? Yeah, so 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 although I don't like to, you know, we were doing that before and having and, and perhaps not paying appropriate attention to those impacts at the rezone stage. That's why we asked to have this, or I asked to, to have this additional hearing. We can still use that as, as that can come, go into your guys' consideration, knowing that you do have the option to hold to those standards down the road. You just have to make sure you're paying attention to them now and discussing them. Now. But it's um, problematic so with just, the MLD. Just, oh, go ahead, yeah. Isn't that problematic with the MLD? Because could they, could they not um, split, I don't know what size those parcels are. I can't They're remember. Off hand, but, but could they not uh, reduce those parcel sizes down to the, say, 10 and impact that road? That's possible, right. Um, and without us being able to hold that. I think that's, that's correct. Just wanted to that's problem raise the point that. Except for the way that we have been interpreting lately code we no longer will allow the contiguous yeah so they, we don't allow contiguous and then if they come to us with you know seven contiguous lots already we we look at that as a subdivision we've asked them to plan for the entire park. yeah because i think there were three parcels is what was that were in that thimble bear area they're 20 acres right. um, so when, so they'd be able to split one so in two but, but again let's not get sidetracked like this one right i i just want we're having fun we're talking. trying to address the Possible right. effects. Yeah. So yeah, but nevertheless, the, what you're looking at is the effects of density change in the area, and so whether it breaks down or not, by changing the zoning, you still have you, there's still going to be a potential impact to density. Yeah, that's, you don't that's what choose. we're talking about. That's what the discussion is about. Is that potential? And my my insistence that we address this topic now at the rezone stage doesn't mean we have to forget about the fact that we can address some of the concerns later down, later down the road. Just we were focusing so much on, on handling it down the road that I didn't think we were honoring the statute that required us to give that consideration now. Okay. And then I just got one more thing and it's the school, school district. Um, I think, I think the district responded. Um, I think it, it's problematic to have people talk about having a discussion, um, with the superintendent. I mean, I get it. Yeah, you probably contacted the superintendent and had a discussion, but that probably, I don't think I can consider that because we we have a form, we have the letter and it specifically talks about any possible adverse, but it, it doesn't, it just says it isn't. So I mean, I would I would go back to that standard. So you if you if you choose to give more credence to the letter, the official letter that you received from the, the school district, as opposed to what somebody gave you as hearsay, you can totally do that. Just say, I, I, think, I, think, the, I think the letter is more, more probative because it's, it's an official document from the school district. I think that's what you're driving at, right? Well, right. I, I don't even think I can consider that right. because I consider that hearsay. Sure. Yeah. All right, that's it. Okay. So let's take these one by one. So let's first start at the, the beginning of the beginning. Um, the reason we are back here in the reconsideration, the only reason we reconsidered this portion of it is because even though um, when I looked through the file the first time, I looked at what was submitted by the agencies that would determine whether what the impact was, and it was pretty slim pickings. And we can't control the agencies. We can't force the agencies to comply. We can beg a little bit, which it sounds like uh, Daniel may have done this time to get him to at least submit something, at least some of them did. Um, but we can't force them. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the information we have at the time. Um, we didn't articulate that. And that's why we are back here because we didn't articulate that we had taken in consideration the information we had, the evidence we had at the time. And so therefore um, we moved the way we did. So now we're back here to actually articulate with actually better information. So I see the benefit to the reconsideration. I know it's kind of a pain, but uh, for everybody to keep coming into this building all the time, but. Um, this is an important factor because we've gotten some real viable information here. Um, no issue with Northern Lights. They have the ability to have a, they have a huge um, 
uh, capacity out there, so that's not an issue. Panhandle Health, that wouldn't happen now. That would happen if the landowner chose to develop, which he's saying he's not developing. And I want to cover this. If he chooses to develop in 20 years, that's his right, but that's not what we're here to consider. We're here to consider the zone change today. Padre School District, um, their enrollment has been dropping dramatically, and if you listen to uh, to the uh, state uh, economist, he told us why, and it's because most people are moving here are retired folks with no children. So we're starting to see enrollments drop dramatically. We're starting to see issues with, with that. Actually, the school district's getting a little bit concerned about funding because their funding's based on a lot on, on enrollment. Um, but when you look at it in whole, I live on Sunnyside. Our kids were always bused into Sandpoint. Even though they weren't bused to Northside, they weren't bused to the Kootenai School, they were always bused to, into Sandpoint to Farm and Stidwell. And they didn't seem to have a problem with it. They turned out to be normal adults. Um, they talked about their capacity there. They talked about a portable that they had actually had there and was being occupied. And they gave us the actual numbers of their enrollment over the last 20 years to show it, which was good, good stats, good information. But you can see there was a de there's a definite drop. And so that it precipitated them to, to move, remove that portable. And they said they can bring it back and have three. Other uh, transportation department spoke specifically to their ability to make sure that kids got to school through uh, movement on their on their transportation, which is important. And again, and I've, uh, I've got firsthand knowledge of that because it happened with our kids. Um, Fish and Game, you know, I read their comments. They're viable. However, I don't know that they're relative, at, at least in the capacity that we're discussing today. Um, Idaho DEQ, they want to wait until they know what the development looks like. How can they pop that's the same way for really for, um, for Northside Fire. How can you determine what it would actually be until you actually had a plan? Um, and, the, and the plus to Northside is, is the impact fees would help them expand their, their, um, their actual uh, services, maybe even hire some full -time, more full-time people. Road and Bridge did a great job with their analysis. Um, 1,400 vehicles per day on the ITD's 2018 count. And even with the growth we've had, when you look at the actual percentage of growth year over year, that uh, we keep track of, um, it's nowhere near, near the 16,000 cars a day. Will there be more traffic if they choose to develop this someday? Absolutely, there's already been more traffic. So taking that into account, Forest Service didn't comment, um, even all the way down to the floodplain review. There can't be a floodplain review really until we actually have a development plan, if the owner chooses to develop. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I wanna cover on here. Uh, this limits the impact of future with um, Preston said it limits the impact um, impact of future boards on development. Absolutely not, because we still have that next step. If he chooses to develop down the road, he's going to have to go through this a more extensive, um, time-consuming process where all this is going to be revisited again. And this time, you'll actually get comment from from Northside Fire that will speak specifically to a development plan if there ever is one. Same thing with a lot of these agencies. I mean, it, this, to me, this is, I know it's in the, I know it's in the Land Use Planning Act, but it seems futile to discuss this now, but because we don't know, really know what it is. We have an applicant saying, I don't want to develop. We don't have a development plan, um, which we desperately need to have one, um, but we still have that. We still, there's no limit to the future, uh, future boards. They will absolutely be able to deny it if it doesn't meet those legal standards. Sheriff's comment about Thimbleberry, um, again, MLD, they'd only be able to do one, so that'd create one extra lot. Unless they sell the property. Christina, close. Um, they'll only be able to one next to, but they also have the opportunity to build a road from their property because these do connect to their adjoined properties. Um, so they could build a road in and there, and, or they could participate in a, in a road agreement with all the folks in Thimbleberry that would actually greatly benefit um, all the people in Thimbleberry because it sounds like their road desperately needs some maintenance. I um, mean, that's a privately maintained road. Um, School district information, Preston said it wasn't specific enough. I got to disagree. This is very specific. They gave us charts to show their their um, their uh, population and how it's moved. Um, water info, um, Odin Water District. They don't serve the property. So again, that's not, that's not that's really irrelevant. But it's also, again, one of those things, water and sewer are the two big ones. If they do decide to develop some sometime in the future, then they're still going to have to get water or sewer. Without it, there is no development. Let's see. Um, telling the applicant he needs to provide info regarding impact seems a bit odd to me in that, in that you want the applicant to bring in, if you had the applicant bring in the info, the first thing we hear from the crowd is that, well, you can't, 
you can't look at that because the applicant brought it in, um, wrote our own department, solicited the, solicited the info, and this, which is absolutely appropriate. So I, I reject that statement. Uh, and uh, as far as the applicant's right to request his own change, um, when he decides he wants a development, if he decides he wants a development, this is an applicant that's said that, listen, I think my property is improperly zoned. If you could go back and talk to some of the people that were on that committee that, that did the rezone in 2008, they will tell you that they spent three years working on the comp plan, were so tired at the end, they just threw some colors on the, on the map and walked away. There was no research. There was no development of, of any information. Quiet, because we've actually had one of them on our planning commission right now, and he's made that statement directly. So um, that being said, um, if someone comes to us and they want to pay the money to go through the process, and we thank you for your check, it's awesome, it helped pay Jeff's salary, no, I'm mm -hmm. just kidding, um, then we're going to take that request seriously. And if, if they want to, just for giggles, want to move it back to what it was when they bought it, which I agree, I couldn't find, even when we looked at this first time, I couldn't find a reason that any of that property should be 20 acres zoned, zoning to begin with. It didn't match up with anything we had. Um, as far as our as far as ordinances, our land use ordinances. So, um, have I satisfied your desire to keep rolling? Keep the, okay. Um, we already talked about north side. Um, let me see. If I that's off what the public comments were that we needed to address. Yeah. So I struggle with with moving to. Uh, to approve the reconsideration based primarily on the fact that uh, this is supposed to be about the impact about the impact on public services. Um, we've gotten letters from appropriate agencies that talk about impact. Um, all the letters seem to contain good information. Why can't I find my notes? Um, so I would struggle with having to agree with the applicant and I would move to uh, deny the, reconcil the uh, reconsideration. Thank you. So let me ask a question why Dan's fumbling around there. Um, so the comp plan refers this to this as egg forest 10 or 20. Is that correct? Because um, I think there's been some insinuations that this is uh, the comp plan refers to this as, as 20s. It's, it's both or either. Mm -hmm. Current zoning refers to it. Right. The plan future land use map refers to it as the 10 or 20. That, but that was the comment that was made. I just wanted to try to clarify that it, it is referred to as either. Did I clarify for your comments? No. Public oh, comments closed. Sorry. I see if there's anything else. All right. The current zone. We already covered that. We already covered the sufficient insufficient information. It's actually quite sufficient. Yeah, I think that's about it. Anything else you want to add before we go to a motion? No. I think we I think what we what we did here was we made sure that we clarified for the record. Um, that the law has been followed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to do actually motion to approve to affirm the boards? Uh -huh. If that's what you're, if that's where you're so. Whoa, 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 no, no. Deny. Yeah, oh, you go. right. Sorry. That page. Yep. Thank you. I've read both of them, so I kind of familiarized myself. <laughs> you almost had us. Everybody's known. Let's get Susan <laughs> Bowman as far as you keep it at the way. All right. Mr. Chairman, I move to deny the request for reconsideration and uphold the board's previous decision approving project file ZC0028-21. This motion is based on the board's previous decision approving the file, new evidence and testimony presented at the hearing and for the reasons stated during deliberations. I further move to adopt the findings of fact and conclusions of law consistent with this motion and which reflect the deliberations made at this hearing during planning staff to draft those findings for signature by the chairman, then transmit them to all interested parties. This action does not result in the taking of private property. Now we'll step down to the chair in a second. Roll call vote. Commissioner McDonald. Aye. Aye. Motion passes. We don't have, so there's no further action because this one has a zone change ordinance. 
That's correct. Okay. It's just, uh, All right. Let me just, yeah. Okay. So it is, uh, I can never do military time. Three.